On the 24th of February, 1986, police in Talladega, Alabama, forced entry into the home of 24-year-old Sherry Weathers. The profoundly deaf mother of two had not turned up to school for nearly a week, and the reason soon became clear. Sherry and her two young children had been strangled to death and piled on top of each other in the shape of a cross. The utter callousness of it, of not only killing them, strangling them, but then posing them to be discovered, it's a, an act of a vile human being. The horrific scene will forever be etched in the minds of the two detectives who worked on the case. When you see something like that, you can't help but, but think about your own child. This could happen to my child too. And so now you know you got to do everything you possibly do to bring this person to justice. The killer was a 31-year-old artist named Daniel Siebert, and his macabre masterpiece was far from complete. Two more bodies would soon be discovered, but the police had no idea where to find him. He was in the wind. We didn't know where he was, but we knew that somebody was going to die until he was caught. Daniel Siebert had made his mark as one of the world's most evil killers. When 33-year-old Daniel Siebert was sentenced to death for the murder of Linda Jarman on the 17th of April, 1987, it signaled the end of the killer's cold-blooded career. On the 19th of August, he received a second death sentence for the murders of Sherry Weathers and her two children. Officially found guilty of five murders, authorities believe that Siebert was responsible for many other deaths across the US in the mid-1980s. Homicide detective Eugene Jacks was part of the policing team who hunted the killer for over six months before his dramatic arrest in September 1986. He killed Sherry because she was deaf, and she would never amount to anything because she was deaf. He killed those two little boys because their mother was dead and they would never amount to anything because they would have a mother. He killed Linda Jarman to get her car. He says he killed Linda Odom because she was a racist. I think he just killed people because he liked to kill people. In a series of interviews with the killer, Eugene learned a lot about just how callous Daniel Siebert could be. If you didn't know what kind of monster he really was, you could actually like him, but he had no compassion for anyone, no feelings for anyone. These people didn't matter to him, not at all. He didn't hate them. He just didn't have any feelings for them, none whatsoever. This killer's story begins in Mattoon, Illinois, a small city in America's Midwest. Siebert was born in 1954, so these were the post-war years in the US. The economy was starting to boom. We have the idea of the American dream, but I think when we look behind closed doors at his family life, it was anything but that. There are reports of abuse from his father towards his mother and towards him. Father was an aggressive man. He uh, mistreated both Danny and his mother. He was a man who was violent and abusive and controlling. And this is the role model of masculinity that Sieber grows up with. So I think that there is a real sense of shame that Sieber maintains throughout his life. And having been victimized, I think that Sieber was always trying to, to turn the tables and be the aggressor. Siebert's parents divorced in 1968, just a month before his 14th birthday the young man's life began to spiral out of control. He became addicted to drugs. He had uh, got into prostitution, himself acting as a male prostitute. 
I think there were several warning signs in Siebert's childhood and adolescence that point towards a, a very troubled individual. He's somebody who could not make relationships work with other people. He didn't relate to his peers particularly well. There was a feeling of rejection from the family environment. And it's this sense of isolation and later the choice to be isolated, which is something that's very concerning for me. There was nothing about him that could be described as ordered. He was like a Catherine wheel, going round and round in every single direction, a firework. Aged 18 and looking for some stability in his life, Siebert enrolled with the military in 1972. Siebert's decision to try and join the Marines is a really, really interesting part of this case because it's what that decision symbolises. The Marines symbolise this alpha male, this toughness, this kind of real American hero type persona. And I think Siebert wanted to try and live up to that. Unfortunately, he couldn't deal with the order the Marines brought him. And quickly, well, within a year, I went absent without leave. After being dishonorably discharged from the Marines, Siebert was once again at a loose end. But the troubled young man had a hidden talent that soon began to flourish. One thing that Siebert excelled at was as an artist. It was the only thing he was good at. You can tell by looking at some of his drawings, it was just, you know, I think he was expressing his fantasies in his drawings. That's how he got started with that. He was quite a person. I mean, he, he had an engaging personality. Enjoyable to talk with, really. If you didn't know what kind of person he was down deep, you would to actually enjoy sitting and talking with him. But life for the charming young artist remained difficult. Between 1972 and 1978, he was principally based in Los Angeles. And there were a series of offenses, drug offenses, some violence, charges of battery. It was a life lived on the edge, uh, on the fringes of society and on the fringes of the law. By January 1979, 24-year-old Siebert was living in Las Vegas. He was in a relationship with a male partner. It was reportedly an abusive one that ended with him fatally stabbing his lover. This homicide was a particularly vicious one because Siebert stabbed his partner 29 times. Now, for me, that means that he has made that decision 29 times to put the knife in again. This was somebody who knew what they were doing. They knew what they were doing was wrong and they chose to do it anyway. Despite the viciousness of the slaying, at his subsequent trial, Siebert was charged with manslaughter, not murder. Siebert insisted that it was a matter of self-defense. How it can be to stab someone that many times is slightly beyond me. But it did seek to throw into doubt whether it was a premeditated murder and therefore added strength to the argument that it was a crime of passion. I think because this was a homosexual relationship, there was a tendency for the court to just want to accept that narrative and put this case to bed because there was still stigma around homosexuality in the US at this time. And I think that was perhaps what drove this offence in the first place because a lot of violence has its roots in shame. I think Siebert was fundamentally ashamed of who he was. He never accepted who he was. He never felt that society would accept him for, for his true identity. So I think this early offence is so important and the criminal justice system's reaction to it was just not good enough. Siebert was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but after serving just two, he escaped while on work detail in December 1981. Now, we really do have a lethal weapon waiting to go off. While he's on the run, he kidnaps a woman at gunpoint in San Francisco, and she only escapes by jumping out of the moving car on the Golden Gate Bridge. It is a remarkable, remarkable escape because in my own mind, I'm not the slightest doubt that he intended to kill her. Siebert was recaptured the following day in nearby Oakland and returned to prison. An extra year was added to his sentence, but in 1985, he was freed on parole on the proviso that he would return to court to face charges for the abduction and assault 
he'd committed during his brief escape. Due to attend court in San Francisco in December 1985, Siebert didn't turn up. His next known whereabouts were over 800 miles away in Tucson, Arizona, where he was found hitchhiking and heading east. But now Daniel Siebert is not calling himself Daniel Siebert, he's calling himself Daniel Spence. He's given a lift by a man called Donald Hedron, who is on his way to Alabama. Before the journey comes to an end, Donald has offered Spence a post as a volunteer at the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind, in which Hendron works. Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind is a big part of the Tallulah community. It's actually a community of its own, or a family of its own, you might say. And he has, superficially at least, the perfect cover. Artistic young man, happy to volunteer at an institute for those with deafness and blindness. Leaving his troubles in California far behind him, Siebert settled down in Talladega, Alabama in January 1986. Working at the AIDB, he had a new identity and a new community of friends. After he arrived here, people realized that he was an accomplished artist and he was asked to do a mural at AIDB, which he did. Uh, and that's one of the reasons he stayed here for a while, was doing that mural. Once again, he hid in plain sight. The affable art volunteer, friend of Donald, welcome in the Institute. And then, and it's almost heartbreaking, he meets Sherry Ann Weathers a 24-year-old deaf mother of two small boys, and they form a relationship. A new circle of friends had welcomed 31-year-old Daniel Siebert into their lives with open arms, but they had no idea they'd allowed a brutal killer into their close-knit community. Siebert spent much of his time at the apartment of his new girlfriend, 24-year-old Sherry Weathers. By the 24th of February, Sherry, a single mother of two, hadn't turned up at the school for almost a week. Her concerned friends contacted the authorities. In February 1986, uh, the police department received a call for a welfare check at Sunrise Apartments in Talladega. Police were dispatched. Officer Tom Byerman was the first on the scene. When he entered Sherry Weathers' apartment, he discovered the bodies of Sherry Weathers and the two boys. He immediately backed out, locked the door, and called for an investigation. Eugene was joined on the case by an investigator from the district attorney's office, Dennis Surrett. We arrived at the apartments, and the police department had already had the scene roped off. And we met the other investigators, went into the apartment, and as you walk into the room, there's a bedroom, and then there's a living room, and there's a kitchen. And right in the center of the living room and the kitchen, you see three bodies. It's quite horrible. I haven't forgotten it after all these years. One of the next door neighbors had heard the two little boys playing in a tub. He got them out of the bed. He strangled the two little boys. He actually woke them up because they were in bed asleep. He wanted them to know that they were being killed. He wanted them to feel that fear. And he stacked their bodies on top of the mother. It looked like it formed a cross. That's my first impression. Sherry Weathers and her two sons, five-year-old Chad and four-year-old Joseph, had been strangled to death five days earlier on the 19th of February. It was a sickening scene even for seasoned detectives. But the team knew they needed to stay professional and not let their emotions get in the way of their police work. You know the minute you walk into that scene, you know this is a death penalty case. And you know things have to be done differently. Everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be exact. Everything has to be documented. I's dotted, T's crossed, because you know where this is headed to. Because you know a murder of two or more is done. It's going to be a death penalty case. And then the emotional part hits you. You know, this is a young mother. This is two young children had their lives ahead of them. What kind of 
person would do this. Uh, I mean, it's just, emotionally it hits you. That's the second thing after, after reality is what you got. Then emotionally, you're hit, you know, especially if you have children. When you see something like that, you can't help but think about your own child. This could happen to my child too. It's something that you don't, you just don't forget about it. Just as the two investigators were getting to grips with their Halloween day, some more worrying news came in. We're in the middle of processing that scene. We'd been there probably two or three hours processing the scene for evidence. And then we were notified that Linda Jarman, who was a friend of Sherry Weathers, she did not show up for classes that day. She lived in an adjoining apartment, not to this building, but to the next building. So Dennis and I went to her apartment and uh, we discovered her on the bed, in the bedroom, and she'd been strangled. 33-year-old Linda Jarman, a deaf teacher at the same institute where Sherry was a student, had been murdered in cold blood. He used a sock and just strangled her in her own bed. Of course, most people don't know what a VCR is these day and times, but back in those days, VCR was worth some money, so he stole her VCR in order to get money to travel further. Linda Jarman's cream-colored car was also missing. The team would report their findings to former Talladega County District Attorney, Robert Rumsey. The evidence would show that after he strangled Sherry and Chad and Joey, that he went to Linda Jarman's apartment telling her that he had had a fight with Sherry and could he sleep on her couch when she went back to bed and went to sleep, then he went in and he strangled her to get her car to leave. After speaking to acquaintances and colleagues of Sherry and Linda, the detectives soon had a number one suspect who they discovered had been using a different alias. At that point, we learned the name Daniel Spence from the people at the school. And we start running him in the computer to see if we find out a Daniel Spence, who is he, where is he, everything we could find out. And it's determined that his name is actually Daniel Lee Siebert. Once we developed him as a suspect and, and, and got his true identity, we'd put a nationwide pickup out on Danny Siebert and Linda Jarman's car. He quickly became the prime suspect because Daniel Spence wasn't here and Linda Jarman's car was gone. As the duo headed to Siebert's apartment building, they soon discovered there was another potential victim. So we go knocking on the door, and there's no answer at the door. A neighbor comes out and says, why are you here? So we're looking to see Mr. Siebert. He said, well, he's not here. He said, but I got to tell you, my girlfriend's missing. Well, who's your girlfriend? It's Linda Odom. How long has she been missing? Oh, two days, I hadn't seen her. She hadn't been home. Well, you know if she's ever connected with this guy here, Mr. Siebert? Yeah, they're kind of friends. Well, you need to go to the police department file a report. In the space of 24 hours, four people had been found dead and another was missing. The investigators needed to find Daniel Siebert fast. And they soon had word from authorities over 350 miles north of Talladega. We received information from Elizabethtown, Kentucky, that they had located Linda Jarman's car right off the interstate in Elizabethtown. That's when Dennis and I left here to go there to process the car for fingerprints and physical evidence. And so they take us to the scene, and we go up an embankment from where the car was, and we find a campsite. We uncover a campsite. And Eugene and I, we find identification to the boys, we find the information on Sherry Weathers and Linda Jarman all at that campsite. So we're fairly certain at this time we're on the right trail. It was a huge breakthrough that confirmed Daniel Siebert was their man. We got Daniel Siebert's fingerprints out of the car. Plus, by the evidence, we knew that tied to him the type of cigarettes he smoked and the type of chewing gum that he chewed. We recovered photographs of women and children, women's cosmetics, there were also some quite chilling 
items at this campsite. There were photos of the Weathers family, there were drawings of the Weathers family. And I think this emphasis on those victims is so significant in this case. This young mother and her two children seem to have quite a lot of importance for Sieber because I think that he didn't feel they deserved to be alive. These boys were happy. They were loved and cared for by their mother. I think he felt a real sense of envy and resentment towards them. It was something that he wanted to relive. And I think those three murders of Sherry Weathers and her two children were the murders he was most proud of. Despite being sure Seabert was responsible for at least four murders, the dangerous killer remained undetected. Interesting, Eugene, uh, both of them are excellent processors. They go and they're in Kentucky for quite a while. So they were up there several days and he was in the wind. We didn't know where he was, but we knew that somebody was gonna die until he was caught. In Linda's car, Eugene and Dennis had recovered an address book belonging to 31-year-old Siebert, which would eventually prove to be an important find. I had one investigator. Her main job, I'd say, in, in this investigation was to stay in contact with known associates of Siebert. She had built a rapport with the girlfriend of Siebert's out there, and she promised that if she heard from him, she would call. With every day that passed, the investigators knew Siebert could strike again at any moment. Each day when you went to work, the first thing you did was start checking tips and leads on the possibility of where Siebert was. There wasn't a day that went by that you didn't do something on the Siebert case. I don't know how many miles that we put on cars going from here to there to check out leads or information on Siebert or some of his friends or this, that, and the other. I mean, Lord, there's no telling. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, Siebert's location remained a mystery. The investigators desperately searched in vain. But in reality, he was over 900 miles from Talladega, Alabama, in New Jersey, and was about to claim another victim, 57-year-old tour guide Beatrice McDougall. Daniel Siebert was in Atlantic City, staying in a hotel on March 8th of 1986, walked by a room of a Mrs. McDougall that was a tour guide. She was fixing up for a reception for a hospitality room. He would have deduced fairly quickly that she's a tour guide, so she's likely to have some cash on her. Siebert was determined to get his hands on Beatrice's money by any means necessary. And he goes in there and kills her. We don't know at that point that it's Siebert, but he's off and in the wind, and we ain't got a clue where he is after that. He just drops off the radar. Siebert had stabbed Beatrice twice in the stomach and strangled her to death in an opportunistic attack. I think that there is just no regard for the, the rights or the feelings of other people. It's all about him. He needs money at this point in time because he's on the run. Um, he also wants to kill any potential witness to this crime, this crime of theft. So her life was just not considered valuable by him. As Siebert remained undetected, the bad news continued for investigators in Alabama. On the 30th of March, 1986, another victim of the 31-year-old artist would be discovered. We're all actually at the DA's office working on another case, and we get a call that we've got a body. And just outside of Talladega, there's a little cemetery on the left-hand side of Alabama Highway 21. And there we find a skeletonized body. No question, it had been there for a long time. Decomposition has already come and gone. And we sift through everything. She's not buried or anything. She's been laid on top of the ground. We know it's female, and that's all we know. And we sift through the pine straw and everything, looking for all the bones, the teeth, and this, that, and other that we could find to identify. And ultimately, she was identified as Linda Odom, the girl that was missing from the next-door neighbor of Seabrook. The timeline suggested that 32-year-old cocktail waitress Linda Odom was Siebert's first victim. 
Siebert strangled Linda on the 19th of February in 1986, meaning he'd killed five people on that one day. Linda's body was taken to Siebert's apartment and he disposes of the body by lowering it in sheets out of the window and then taking it to a, a nearby cemetery to dispose of it. And interestingly, Siebert said that, that when he was disposing of Linda's body, he started punching her. I mean, she was obviously dead at this point in time, but I think that was something that enhanced his feelings of control over this victim. And I think that that, that sense of rage as well that he expresses at this point in time. The way that he's seeing this community, this community who are so welcoming, who are so inclusive, who are loving towards one another, this is something that he feels he was entitled to when he was younger, something that he never had. And these people don't deserve it, according to him. So I think that's what's underlying all of this behavior. This is a young girl. Uh, she didn't deserve what happened to her, but she just dumped him some tear. That kind of hurts your heart that somebody is so cruel to do something like that. What the detectives in Alabama didn't know is that by now, Siebert was in prison in New Jersey, serving 61 days for assaulting a woman. When he was arrested for the altercation, he used the stolen social security card of murdered five-year-old Chad Weathers as identification. This meant that no one had made the link between Siebert and any of the murders. So during the time that Siebert was on the run, he actually used the identities of Sherry Weathers' two boys um, to, to gain new identification. And at this point in time, it was relatively easy to do that, to use a child's identity to get a social security number. But I think that the significance of this is more than just a practicality. I think there is, is something much more meaningful going on here. By possessing the, these children's names, by presenting your yourself as them, you are owning them, you are possessing them, they are yours, and it's that extension of control over your victims. After serving his time for the assault, Siebert was in police custody again in June 1986, this time in Virginia. This young officer stops Siebert, and in the car he finds ropes and knives, ladies' belongings, photographs, just all types of things that just made him very suspicious of this man. They checked the car and it was stolen. So he was arrested for uh, car theft, uh, being in, in possession of, of the stolen car. He was using the identity of Joey Weathers, using the Social Security card as identification. He made bond and he was gone. Siebert was incredibly cunning, incredibly manipulative. I think he was well aware of the fact that law enforcement wasn't particularly well joined up in terms of interstate communication and sharing of information at this time. And I think he, he truly did take advantage of that. In August, Siebert was yet again in another state, Maryland. He assaulted a woman in Baltimore, but wasn't captured by the police. He then headed back west towards Nashville, Tennessee. The investigators in Alabama still had no idea where he was, but a breakthrough was on the horizon. Detectives who'd reached out to people listed in Siebert's address book had been contacted by one of his ex-girlfriends in Nevada. She had news that would finally crack the case. This lady calls from out there and says that she had just spoken with Danny Siebert on the phone. And he told what time it was where he was at. And she could hear thunder, and it was raining. So the investor came and then told the rest of us about the call and that it was raining at that particular time. With very little information, the investigators tried to trace the source of Siebert's call. Said, we're not easy to trace telephone calls, but they told us if we had any idea where he was, it would make it a lot easier. Otherwise, it could take three weeks to a month to trace it. I told the investigator, go call the National Weather Service, find out where it's raining in that time zone. It was raining in Tennessee. That was it in that time zone. We were able to use that information and trace the telephone call to Hurricane Mills in Tennessee uh, to a little convenience store restaurant there. It was a stunning revelation. 
Detectives could now pinpoint Siebert to the small community of Hurricane Mills, Tennessee, 70 miles west of Nashville. So I called the district attorney, told him we, we're going to Tennessee. He said, okay, I'm coming with you. There's no question we were keyed up because we spent six months and no telling how many trips, not me, but how many trips with the investigators and stuff had gone running down every little lead that they could come up with, which really had proved fruitless. And, but this is a live hit now. So we all loaded up in cars, headed to Tennessee. I called TBI, which is Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. This is what we got going on. We got him traced to this location, and we're headed that way. After six and a half months of searching for Siebert, the anticipation of his arrest was at the forefront of the detectives' minds. The journey up there was, it's, it's almost like waiting for your birthday party. We were all extremely excited. Well, by the time we got there, it was late night, and we decided not to do anything but send one, by, one investigator in there to see if they could see anything to the search first, because you had this service station where that the call was from, and then you had a restaurant up here, and then you had another filling station, a restaurant up here. So one investigator went in, kind of knew the owner, and said, yeah, he's been painting some signs for me, and he'll be in here in the morning to collect his check. It would be a sleepless night for the arresting officers. Everybody's upbeat. Everybody's tired, but everybody's upbeat. And I don't think a single one of us took a nap that night out there on the road, because we were just on the roadway, uh, waiting for morning. The following morning, the 5th of September, 1986, the team were ready to pounce as dawn broke over Hurricane Mills. It's hard to describe what it was like sitting there waiting for him to, him to come around the building, but I'd always wondered if I'd recognize him when I saw him. When he rounded the corner of that building, there was no doubt in my mind, that's him. As soon as he went in the door, Dennis and I were out the door. We went in behind him. Uh, he wasn't there. Scared us to death. We just looked at the clerk, where is he? And she pointed to the restaurant, and we went in. And TBI and uh, the captain went in and arrested him in the men's room. And, uh, his only question to us was, uh, how'd y'all find me? I mean, he's got about six weapons just aimed at him, and he's caught with his butt down, basically. Uh, we seized his backpack. We found where he'd been staying in a car, a wrecked out car behind the station. And he is immediately taken to the court in Tennessee. And we contact our governor and ask her for her plane to fly him back. Finally, Daniel Siebert was in police custody. He would never be free again. I mean, man alive, you can't imagine the relief you feel. We've got him. He's not going to hurt anybody else. And there again, you're thinking of Sherry, and you're thinking of the babies, and Linda, and, and Linda Oden, you're thinking about them. OK, we can put everybody to rest now. And it's, it's the best feeling in the world. The police had their man, but the job was far from done. Detectives were certain he was responsible for the murders of five people in the small community. Linda Odom, Linda Jarman, Sherry Weathers, and her two sons, Chad and Joey. Investigators had stacks of evidence against Siebert, but they were hoping an interview with the 32-year-old would uncover even more secrets. It was tense for me, and I'm sure it was for the captain, because we were wanting to get a confession. This was the end of a long, hard, battle for us, and we wanted him to admit what he had done. Siebert told Eugene about the five murders he'd committed on the 19th of February, 1986, and also confessed to the killing of Beatrice McDougall in Atlantic City on the 8th of March. He showed no remorse for any of the murders. He wasn't concerned at all. Uh, showed no emotion whatsoever. Never shed a tear. You could tell there was no concern in him about what he had done. And if we had released him right there, he'd have done it again in a few days because he had no remorse whatsoever for what he'd done. I've told people want to know how, how he felt about his victims. He didn't feel about his victims. He had no feelings for them one way or the other. He had no feelings for anyone. I don't know that he really 
felt anything about himself, to be honest with you. He just, he had no feelings. I think he was a psychopath. I think he demonstrated every normal, or if you can use the word normal when applied to a psychopath, every possible psychopathic a tendency, an utter lack of remorse, an utter lack of conscience, an utter lack of empathy with other people. They were simply objects. Siebert also confessed to another murder that predated any of the other six whilst he was lodging with Donald Hendren in Alabama. It's early February 1986. Donald Hendron's asleep. Siebert gets out of bed and borrows Donald's car and picks up a girl called Cheryl Evans. She's working as a prostitute in Birmingham and Alabama. He kidnapped her, robbed her and killed her and uh, carried her body to Ohatchee and dumped it in a roadside garbage dump. And then just returned the car like nothing had happened. That brought the tally of victims to seven, but Eugene was certain there were still more. He had uncovered a telling piece of evidence when searching Siebert's home back in February. In his apartment, I'd found a road atlas. I'd gone through the road atlas, and out on the west coast, he had had X's with zeros, X's and zeros, and he just had X's. I asked him about those, and he said every place that there was an X with a circle around it is where he had killed someone, and just the X's were robberies. I contacted each of these jurisdictions, and sure enough, each place that there was an X with a circle, they had recovered a body. This is basically Siebert's commemoration of the murders that he's committed. I think every time he looked at that map, he would have felt powerful, he would have felt superior. And we, we do often see this in cases of serial killers. Siebert confessed to killing three sex workers in Nevada and California in late 1985. The fact that he's targeted sex workers is really significant for me because he's preying upon these women's vulnerabilities. He's well aware that society does not value these individuals as much as it values others, and therefore he has access to them, he has the opportunity to harm them. He was also indicted for the murder of Beatrice McDougall, but never went to trial for this. Despite admitting to as many as 13 murders, detectives could only link 10 victims to the 32-year-old. But for his impending trials, Siebert would only be indicted for the murders of the five that had been thoroughly investigated in Alabama. There was five homicides. Linda Jarman was a capital case because it was murdered during the commission of a robbery or a theft of getting a car. Sherry Weathers, Chad and Joey was a capital case because it was murder of two or more people pursuant to a common plan scheme or design. Linda Odom was not a capital case. He pled guilty to Linda Odom after all of this life sentence. During three trials over the course of five months between March and August 1987, Siebert was found guilty of all five murders and sentenced to death twice. I've probably tried 30 death penalty cases or more, but this one is just the magnitude of it and what makes another human being go do something like this. I mean, you got a woman that's deaf that he's intimate with, a four and five year old who he wakes up from their sleep to strangle, goes to another deaf woman and kills her just to get her car to get out of there. I mean, if it's sticking in your mind, it'll be there on my deathbed. I think the sentences that he received were appropriate. I think he, he committed the, the most serious of crimes, so that deserves the most serious of sentence. But I think if, if we were to ask his victims' families, um, they're, they're not going to have their, their loved ones brought back. Um, I think they, they have achieved some sense of justice, but at the same time, I think they were asking a lot of questions as to how this man had, had slipped off the radar of the authorities. This man had committed a homicide in 1979, and he went on to commit more. So could more have been done to prevent that? I think one of the things that always moves me most about this story is that um, when he was asked about the killing of Sherry Ann and the boys, he said Sherry didn't have anything to say, Joey didn't have anything to say, Chad didn't have anything to say, 
and I don't have anything to say. If there's anything that could be more heartless, more utterly revolting, more depraved than that remark, I have yet to hear it. And this is a man who snuffed out the life of a deaf 24-year-old mother and a two children aged five and four. It is, it is utterly monstrous. In August 1987, Daniel Siebert began his death row sentence. For 18 months, the case had consumed the investigators who had worked on it. Now they could breathe a sigh of relief. I still think about those two little boys. Uh, and always will, I'm sure. I'm sure Dennis and other investigators do too, because they all had children too. I don't know what it is, but I know he's a psychotic killer. And had he not been taken in Tennessee, that, that's what's so outstanding about the police work. Had he not been taken in Tennessee, I don't know whether it would have been Arkansas, Oklahoma, Nevada, Utah, or California, but somebody else would have died. And he wasn't through. After numerous unsuccessful appeals throughout the years, 53-year-old Siebert remained on death row for almost 21 years. On April 22, 2008, Daniel Siebert died, but not from lethal injection, from pancreatic cancer, natural causes. In the end, he escaped the death penalty. I mean, this was a personal type of crime. This is not something that you're standing 30 feet away and shoot somebody. This is someone you put your hands around their neck and choke the life out of. That's bad. Think about that. Because it takes anywhere from two to four minutes to do that to someone. And you're sitting there, and you got your hands around the neck, and you're taking the life from them. You got to be enjoying that. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it that way. And if you're enjoying something like that, man, you are bad. And I just wish we had got to look cute. him. I think we felt we were cheated for that. Daniel Siebert was linked to at least 10 murders and was convicted of five but he never tried to justify his reason for killing people. For me, what makes Siebert one of the world's most evil killers is the degree of manipulativeness that he was able to, to exercise. He was able to come across as an individual with feelings, as an individual who cared about others, but those feelings were not genuine at all. They were simply a performance. He was an absolute monster. He was a horrible person. He, he really was. Uh -oh. And that's what comes to mind anytime anyone mentions his name. He's a, he's a monster. Daniel Siebert was a callous killer who felt no remorse. To choke the life out of two children simply because he felt they would never amount to much is a cold-blooded act that cannot be forgiven. We may never know exactly how many lives he took, but Siebert's death means he can no longer harm anyone and will forever be remembered as one of the world's most evil killers.